The Sordes website tells us that decades ago, Alastair Sordes was a tour guide in France. I'd love to have been on one of those tours, I really would. He was exploring the country and getting to know its secrets and its characters. But he eventually turned his scruffy notes into a guidebook. And that is still what Sordes do, but of course they're much more than that. There are two uh, holiday brands. One is uh, Sordes and the other is Canopy and Stars that represent four and a half thousand really rather special places to stay, from tree houses to chateau. The company's recently gone through a profound and exciting change, which we're here to talk about this afternoon, because it's passed into the hands of its employees. Please welcome our final guest, Alistair Sordo. I got a bit of a measure of Alistair out in um, the bar area. We weren't drinking. Um, and I was feeling a bit cold, and you came to my rescue with a jacket and some paracetamol, so thank you very much, but not enough to butter me up. Uh, tell us a little bit more, Alistair, about the origins of, of your company. Well, like some of the best things, it sort of started by accident. I was running a, um, a travel company, taking people on walking tours and cycling tours, getting to know Europe really well, getting under the skin of it, and meeting some fabulous people. And uh, one day somebody wandered into, into my office. She was on the run from the FBI. Um, turned out she was paranoid. It wasn't really on the run from the FBI. And she <laughs> said, I need a job desperately. So we sort of thought, well, what can we do? And there in my filing tray was a list of wonderful places in France where I'd take people to, to stay and visit. And between the two of us, said, let's do a book about it. So I said, um, that's good. What a great idea, a book. Can you write? Mm. Do you speak? Mm, do you speak French? No. Do you like France? No. <laughs> Have you been to France? Hardly. Gave it the job. <laughs> and um, but she had one essential quality, which was um, she was a coper. You could you could drop her in a parachute, or drop her with a parachute into France in the war and say, "We'll just get on and beat the Germans," and she would have done it. And so a year later, she came back with a book. What? Actually, no, she didn't. I had to fire her. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh, making a film instead. So we, had to, we got an we a, a out-of-work lawyer. Can you believe it? An out-of-work lawyer. And um, <laughs> put her to work, and she finished it off, and then lo and behold, a book. What were the drivers for the business, though? Because you've said to me that you're not really bothered about money. Well, I was motivated by... Um, it was a great, I thought it was a great idea. It was going to be fun we were going to um, meet some extraordinary people. And also, I'm, I, my background before that was in the environmental movement. I spent many years as a full-time campaigner for Friends of the Earth. And I've been a Green Party candidate for Parliament. You know very well I never made it. And um, I was very taken aback by the enormity of the damage being done by the tourism industry when I was running my tour at my travel company. I was really shocked to see what travel was doing. It was overwhelming, some of the most beautiful places in Europe. And I thought this is an alternative, a way of getting under the skin, getting people to meet real people in their villages, in their homes, keep money in the local economy, and sensitize them to France, which is the first book. And I do believe if we'd got that book out a bit earlier, we never would have had the Hundred Years' War. <laughs> <laughs> but judging by the people you employed, that wasn't likely to get the book out any earlier. Uh, why then not hand the company over to your two sons? Make them rich. <laughs> she knows very well. <laughs> um, I think quite a lot of money in the hands of uh, young people is a dangerous thing. It would have been dangerous in my hands, I think. Um, my boys, one of them is anarchic, anti-capitalist. He's a rapper. <laughs> um, he, would have told, he would have told me what to do with my money. Well, she has, actually. The other one... Uh, it's very uncomfortable. The other one has... Um, <laughs> the other one has... Um, was always... was, I thought, very comfortably off. Um, he had a good job running the company. And he, he had a very hard-working wife, and he didn't really need... had a house. He didn't need anything much more support from me. I don't think it would have been a clever thing to do. But I was also... Um, I've got quite strong views about... I thought, what's your question? <laughs> Why didn't you just hand the company? Why didn't I just hand it over? I, um, this business of a company exit 
it's such a big one, isn't it? I mean, many people in the room are, are wrestling with it right now. And my accountants and lawyers were always saying, Alistair, you should leave the business. In fact, they were saying, as soon as possible. <laughs> and in fact, they said, as soon as possible, just after I started it. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't want to... I didn't want to sell it to somebody else because I thought that would be a betrayal of everything I believed in. So I did think we were doing things differently and we had a tale to tell. So I wanted to do the honourable thing. I wanted also to be proud of what I've done. I wanted to be able to face my family and say I've done the right thing. So, and I wanted the company to be a vehicle for the achievement of, of some measure of happiness um, for its employees and for all those who use it. So I thought this is the best way. How many employees are going to benefit from this then? And, and tell us a little bit about the structure that you've chosen. Well, I, I chose, I think it's a little bit of an unusual structure. It's, um, it's an employee ownership trust, which is funded from the reserves of the company, and the company's going to take another five years to buy me out. The trust has 52% of the share. Um, I've left 24% of the shares in the hands of the family, so that's, if you like, my inheritance. And then 24% um, I put in the hands of uh, a specially created trust called the Sole Trust. It's a pretty unimaginative name. Um, but the purpose of that trust is to take dividends, should they ever happen, it's going to be a while again, and use those for ecological purposes. I really want the company to carry on having some sort of environmental impact. Because one of my passions in life is sustainability. We'll come on to it later, perhaps. But um, I wanted to make sure that the employees, in their passion for running a company to, for their own interests, didn't lose sight of the deeper meaning behind any organization, which is surely contributing to the community. What was the reaction from your employees when you told them this is what you were going to do? <coughs> well, um, I don't really know. Um, I think they were pretty pleased. I'm, I'm sure they did. Were you quite, you were quite pleased, weren't you? Um, I, think they were, I think they were very pleased, possibly slightly confused, because I have to confess, I ignored all the rules. And I did not, which would surprise you, I didn't, um, I didn't take the advice, which is to prepare the company and prepare the staff. I kept it, well, I did warn them, but I, I didn't talk to them about it. I spent most of my preparatory effort on preparing myself. <laughs> this took quite a long time. Um, you, those of you who've been there, you know very well, it's a, it's a complicated process. You've got to work out how much money you need. You've got to do your financial planning. You know, I'm going to die when I'm 102, so I need so much money every year you know, to repair my bicycles or whatever. I've, um, yeah, I've, I've, I had to sort out my own priorities first make absolutely sure that I wanted to do it and that I would be really pleased at having done it. And there's one little hint, actually, for those of you who need a hint. Um, I had on the board with me a man who was very, very committed to the idea of charitable company ownership. He worked for um, a company in Bristol called Help. Andrews. Thank you. Andrews, a state agency which you may or may not know is very successful, but it's entirely owned by a charity. It was set up by the man who set up Oxfam. And Andrew had run it for, as a chair for 25 years and he was full of praise for it. So he pressed me really hard on this business of a measure of charitable ownership. And he was a sort of rock. So every time I'd, I was floundering and, and, and heading off in various directions, he'd bring me back, say, this is what you've got to do. It's vital that we do the right thing come on, let's press on with it. So having a, a really good a sort of mentor on my side was really helpful. Have you had to, or have you chosen to tell your employees who are now the owners how much money you're going to get from it, from, and particularly a man who's not that bothered about wealth? Have I told them? Hmm. Well, I think they know. I think they know. So I think it's, it's, um... Because that can be a bit of a, a surprise. Well, no. It's not, a, it's not a vast sum of money. I'm, I'm, it's plenty more than I need, really, the truth be told. But it's not, I'm, I'm not going to become wealthy, and it's really equivalent to what I might have taken out over the company for 25 years had I taken out dividends. Because I never took anything out of the company. I took my maximum salary was, I think, £60,000 a year over 25 years. 
Um, so, I think it's fair. How compatible is the, the, the culture, the values of the company with employee ownership? Really compatible. I mean, it's a really neat fit. I felt quite happy about it, about sort of saying to the employees, this is where we are now, because I knew they were sort of halfway there already in their minds. I mean, they're a lovely lot. They're, they're, we've been talking about the environment for years, talking about supporting organic agriculture. We, we occupied a building for about seven years, which was won the Queen's Award for Sustainability. We were Environmental Pub Publisher of the Year, I think three years running. So the environment was a, a constant thread in the company story. So everyone was, everyone was um, plugged into that. And I, th I think they were thoroughly up for it. And I genuinely believe that the cultural shift they have to make is pretty small. The bigger shift, it's not a value shift so much as a shift in attitude between being an employee and being an owner. And I gather that's one of the hardest things. And they're now working on it really assiduously with huge help from the new MD. Mike, the MD, who's sitting in the front row here, came from um, an interesting background. He came from Brittany Ferries. And do you, does anybody here know who owns Brittany Ferries? It's owned by a cooperative of French farmers which is a lovely, a lovely background to come from. And apparently they turn up at their AGM in willy boots and <laughs> onions hanging around their necks. <laughs> and they don't care too much about profit as long as the company is still working really well. How are you going about preparing the em employees <coughs> who are now owners to understand what their role is? Because they might be owners, but they're not going to be managers necessarily. Not everybody will be, that's for sure. And there's a lot to learn about profit and loss and for the finances and conveying all of that to people who've never had to worry about it before. Well, we all are, even our youngest employees in, uh, understand the finer points of a bit dire and all that sort of thing. They're absolutely <laughs> on the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, not the question for me, really, because I'm no longer, I'm no longer there. I'm only there as a board member um, and as chair of the Sorde Trust and as a creditor, I suppose, of the company. So I'm not involved in the cultural shift at all. So I, if you like, I'd rather, I'd rather uh, throw them in the deep end. And now I'm leaving it up to them and Mike to sort out the cultural shift. What were you able to do, or did you choose to do, to make sure that the values and those environmentally friendly credentials that you have cherished and, and have, have prioritized so much are part of Saw Days in, in the future? Because when you're not there to steer it, you're not there to influence in the same way. How do you make sure that it's true to you? It's a good question. God knows what Mike's plotting. Um, well, how did I? Well, I think, first of all, the values were very well in, embedded in the company. I think if you'd asked any employee what, we, what I believed in and what the company believed in, I think they would have given you a pretty good answer. We've talked about values forever, and it's been a values-driven company so I think, if you like, the culture that we associate with employee ownership was pretty deeply rooted before I handed over. And now I'm praying, really, that it doesn't disappear. That it's, I really genuinely believe that it's going to be nurtured, not least because we're an employee-owned company now. You know, being here with all you people gives me hope um, and, and reinforces my confidence that the company really can take what was there before and improve it and add things to it which I never would have dreamed of. I really do believe that. It's an act of faith, but it's well, a well-rooted faith. It's obviously happened quite recently that they've become employee owners, but what changes, maybe quite small, indi almost indiscernible changes, have you noticed within the company in terms of people's attitude to coming to work each day? Well, the first thing I... Uh, yeah, they threw out quite a lot of my furniture. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but with the exception of um, the grand piano, which sits in the middle of the office, and which was always there to me as a sort of token of our readiness to have fun. We, we, had, we used to have jazz concerts and things in the office. But I had a lovely moment the other day when um, a new employee who'd been with us for a week looked just after our choir practice. We have a wonderful choir in the office, which I know that Mike's keen to encourage. The junior employee said, um, oh, i finished work now. I think I'll go and have a piano practice. And he went to the grand piano in the middle of the afternoon and started playing Rachmaninoff. <laughs> and and um, 
I thought, this is, what? And uh, Mike had a grin on his face from ear to ear, and so did everybody else. Maybe they, watched, they were just amused to see my reaction. But I went out of the office that, that afternoon with my heart singing. I thought, well, it's still quirky and weird and unusual <laughs> and prepared to have fun. What, are, what were your anxieties before taking that leap of faith? And what are they for the future? My, my biggest anxieties really are about the survival of a company like ours against the most monumental competition from people like Airbnb and the online travel agency. So it was about the long-term survival of the company. And I genuinely believe and still do that the engagement of employees is going to radically to increase the survival chances of the company. And we are surviving, we're doing okay, and we're full of ideas, and I think that the, the engagement of the employees gives us huge added strength. Because had I been on my own, if you like, with a board around me facing the competition we're now facing, which we didn't have in the first phase, then I think I would have been quite alarmed. But now I've got, I, I think there's much more security for our future. That's one of the um, reasons that Ardman Animation gave when Peter Lord and David Sproxton decided to put 75% of their company into employee entry. They wanted to safeguard its independence for the future. So is, it, that seems, is that quite a, a, a common aspiration? Do you it's very think? common. I think there's, a, there's an ethical thing. You, a lot of founders believe that they've done the right thing with their companies. They want to make sure that other people carry on enjoying it and doing the right thing. But then there's the long-term survival thing, which is a practical matter. And I think um, yeah, that's an, also a very good argument for going employee ownership, uh, employee owned. Yeah. What were the hurdles, though, to get employee ownership off the The hurdles, board? well, first of all, in my head and in my heart, really, just, it's a big deal to give up your baby. Um, once I got over, once I got over, well, I, one of the ways I got over that was by reading, um, meeting David Erdahl, whom you all know, who wrote a book called um, Beyond the Corporation, which almost, that was one of the things that kicked me off, actually, into employee ownership. I'd never heard of it before. Um, as you know, it's a, it's a very little known phenomenon still. So that was a great start, and that got me over the sort of um, emotional and semi-intellectual hurdle of how to, what to do. Then meeting, coming here and meeting other employee owners, that got me over a few more hurdles. Every time I met somebody who'd done it and had the guts to do it, that gave me another kick over the next hurdle. Um, and then I think having a board that was supportive, um, having that man Andrew I told you about, and then having a lawyer who kept, me, kept dragging me through the mire that was the legal process. It was attempting to give up. What? Was it tempting to give up because it was so no, I tricky? No, I couldn't. Once I'd, once I'd made the decision to do it, I knew I was going to do it. And then it's just a question of time. I, I think I faltered. I mean, I, I took far too long over it. But by the time we, we got there, I was absolutely right, right behind it. How long did it take then? From four the, or five that, years. Uh, from the first time you thought of it? Four, four or five years since I read David Erdahl's book. Um, that, was quite the, that was probably the single most powerful moment. And for me, there were two moments in that book which really moved me. One was when David had inherited his very large paper making company in Scotland. He went around and spoke to the employees and met one of them whose family had worked for generations. And he went home that night and suddenly realized that they were working generation after generation to make him rich. And he realized that was just insane and wrong. So that was a powerful story. And the other part of the book which really got to me was the research that he did at university after leaving the company into well-being in employee-owned companies. He went to Italy and he discovered people, the people who lived in a town which where most people work for employee-owned companies tended to live two years longer than as is usual. Lower levels of divorce, drunkenness, heart attacks, childhood pregnancy, all the well-being measures we're familiar with. But they were, in, they were palpably better where employees were engaged. And I, those are two very powerful lessons for me. And uh, they stuck with me, have stuck with me ever since. You said you're still on the board. How difficult is it to let go, having been, well, still having your name in the company's title? Well, it's, 
I've let go in many, many ways. I mean, when my son joined the company, I was politely asked to leave the board. I mean, lots of you have had um, experience of this, I know. And because we had a very good chair, and it, it was better that the father not be there around the table with the son. So I was very much in the background for five years or so. Or so. so I'm quite used to it. And now I'm on the board now because my son's are not there, there aren't those sensitivities. But I'm still very much in the background, and um, I can let go. But what I do find it hard to let go of is the um, a constant drive to, to think of the company and to have ideas. I've got so many ideas. I like so many. I've just been to a talk about the founders, and I know this is quite a common thing. You can't stop having ideas if you're a founder, can you? What to do with them? So the question that came up this afternoon for us was, how can the employees harness the drive and energy and magic that the founder still has. It's a real question for, for employee-owned companies. Like. And how might you like to do that for Sordos? Uh, by there being some structure for idea generation and by being able to see ideas either rejected or accepted and then going through the system. Um, and by being, by being listened to, I suppose, which I feel I am now. But it's, it's, a, it's a very delicate and complicated business handling the founder and the founder sort of handling himself in relationship to the, the company he's left behind or she. You know. So if you took longer than you might have taken to get to this point, what would your advice be to someone considering it? Read a few good books um, about the huge impact of employee ownership on the wider society. Um, ask yourself fundamental questions about how the world you think should work. Is our current system working? And the, the answer to me is a resounding no. And it seems to me the whole world has been turned into a global marketplace. It's as if the world is now a business. And only those who are most acute and most driven and most profit oriented will survive. The world's not like that. The world's a complicated place. And we've got it tragically wrong. And to some extent, we are all stakeholders in this. So those of you who listen to the, um, you all know about the IPCC climate change report, saying we've got 12 years to sort out the planet. I think it's the most important lesson that any of us will ever hear in our lives. It knocks, even knocks social justice and equality and those sort of things, into a cocked hat. We are all now part of a global business which is wrecking the planet. And we've got 10 years to sort it. What are we going to do? And I think employee-owned businesses are better equipped, probably, than most ordinary businesses to think about these things, because employee-owned businesses are thinking businesses. So I think we now, I mean, if I were going to use this, this place here as a platform for anything, I would. I would make a plea to you to see you having a role in the salvation of the planet. I mean, I use, don't use those words lightly. I use them with total sincerity. And if there's anything you can do by your companies to make the world into a less doomed world, then I beg you to do it. You mentioned something to me that I haven't heard of, and I wonder whether this might be part of of your future, it might be an idea that you <laughs> share with your employee owners. The Extinction Rebellion, tell us about that. Well, I told you I had an sort of anarchist son. But he just gave a speech at the launch of an organization last week, I think, called Extinction Rebellion. Which, um, and I didn't know what it was, and I only looked it up um, yesterday, the first time. And it's an extraordinary organization which recognizes what I've just said, that we've got 10 years to sort out our planet, which means massive change, and that our institutions are not going to do it, because we failed to do it so far. And they're going to sign up to rebel against what is, work, what is not working now. So I signed up to, I'm really, I'm, I've committed myself to going to prison should I need to. <laughs> Why might you need to? What's if the rebellion I, going to look if like? If I take part in an Extinction Rebellion protest, because they're saying that civil disobedience and non-violent direct action are the only things left to us to save this extraordinarily beautiful world. 
and I so get that after years of campaigning that I'm going to sign up and I would ask you all to read up Extinction Rebellion and see what you think. How compatible is that going to be with staying on the board of Sordays? Hey, well, actually, um, this is not part of my calculation. The great PR, don't you think? <laughs> Mike? Yeah, elderly, um, elderly geezer um, run over by a bulldozer on Chiswick Bridge <laughs> or locked up for two weeks in, in, the, in jail. It'd be great, it'd be great PR. Alistair, thank you for answering my questions. We have some microphones and we've got 10 minutes or so for you to ask your questions of, of Alistair. Uh, look out for the, the women in pink t-shirts. We've got so many hands going up. There must be questions. Can I see any questions? Hands going up. Yes, here at the front, thank you. Just wait for our... Thank you. So this question is just to let everybody else have some time to think about what they want to ask. I've got a honeymoon coming up in April. Where would you suggest I go? <laughs> Very good. Uh, you say a honeymoon? Yes. Oh, wow. Well, I'm not a marital counsellor. <laughs> I don't need that. I just need a nice place to go. Nice place to go. Well, you go to the Hilton Hotel in, in Birmingham. <laughs> We were lucky to drag you in here, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, give, actually, I'll tell you where to go. Okay. Go to the Hotel Verbano on the Isola dei Pescatore in the Lake Maggiore in Italy. How's that? Why? Why? Nice little hotel, special place, beautiful little island on a lake to die for, surrounded by Alps, stunning countryside, houses that you want to look at. It's a piece of human, part human created paradise. The Italian lakes. How would you get there? Get there by train. You're not going to believe this, but that's where we met. In Italy. In that you lake. Didn't. No, that's right. <laughs> On so that's we, island. Yeah, yeah, near there, near the lake. Near it's there, really, yeah. really yeah. great. They're, it is a beautiful place, you're absolutely yeah. right. In case you didn't hear, she met in. You didn't meet in the Hotel Verbano, did you? No. <laughs> But pretty close. Gosh. Ooh, I got through that. I got through that one. Well okay. done. That's very good. <laughs> I went through. I went to a little cottage without any facilities in Connemara, and I don't think many people now would want to do that. Really. Best two weeks of my life. Marriage hasn't been a patch on. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can Deb have the microphone, please? No more marital advice, please. No, I'm not going to ask for any marital advice. Um, just, I'd like to ask you, Alistair, how you went through the process of recruiting your new MD, because it seems like that was pretty critical to you. The cr process of recruiting a new MD? He is in the front row, remember? He's in the front row. Random choice, really. <laughs> he just wandered into the office one day and said, look, looking for a job. Um, Escaping from the FBI. It was, it was actually done by a recruitment agency in Bristol. That turned, I won't mention any names, but it did turn out to be a rather unusual recruitment agency. I learned later from one of the candidates that she spent an hour and a half with him and he didn't ask her a single question. But, but he did a great job, he gave us a, he gave us a, a short list and then the board interviewed people and Mike was the one who came through. And, uh, He's doing a terrific job. So it's a fairly conventional process. I would have preferred, personally, something much more unconventional. I would have taken Mike on a, on a walk in the Brecon Beacons and, and, not, and then given him a foul lunch afterwards and then got him wet and see how he reacted, something like that. Or I would have taken him to the Hilton Hotel for a minute. <laughs> We get you don't like hill hotels. Um, so, so you talked about the values of the business. So how how uh, what what part did they play in the, in the recruitment process? The who? Sorry. The values, the values of, the of the business. The company, what part did they, they play in the recruitment? Well, we process? were obviously hugely aware of the critical role played by value. I mean, we had to find somebody who was. I'm going to use corporate language aligned with our values. <laughs> how often do you ask your wife? The line. Um, are we aligned tonight, darling? <laughs> um, absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. So, and one of the, one of the biggest things in Mike's favour was that he came from a company 
which he worked for for many years, which he really enjoyed, and which had been known by a bunch of French farmers. Um, he's also been hugely responsible for staff and for a whole range of different operations in the company. So he had a wide range of experience. We also needed somebody with, great, with a lot of professional skill who could sort of tie the company down and make it, and, and, and make it more effective and efficient and get it operating better. So, but values, yes, we could not possibly have employed somebody who didn't share our values. That would have been a catastrophe. Steve over there. Oh, sorry, Aaron wants to ask a question. Steve over there and then gentleman in the middle. Aaron, sorry. Yes. Um, I had uh, the privilege of having a few minutes with you earlier when you first arrived um, over a cup of coffee, and I was uh, intrigued by the notion that arose in the conversation we had that um, you're actually expecting your employees not to make a lot of money out of this employee ownership. Um, uh, New, new direction that they're taking as now as employers. Um, could you say a little more about that? Um, because I'm wondering whether how, you know, how interesting that is for the rest of the employers in this business, in this uh, in this room today. So I'm not expecting employees to make a lot of money. No, I'm not because um, it's not a, it's not a business that I think will ever make a lot of money in the same way um, a financial services organisation might be or a recruitment company. Um, might not, that's not to exclude the possibility. It might. In, in the future, it might come up with something quite extraordinary. But the main purpose was to the main purpose was to provide a sense of purpose and a sense of engagement. I mean, the world can't make everybody wealthy, but it can give everybody a sense of purpose. And I think that's a much more attainable object. And I think it's the first thing they're going to have, um, which will make them come to work more readily and attain a sense of well-being and happiness. If they make a little bit more than they do now, how lovely would that be? If in the fullness of time they make a lot more, that'll be great. And then I hope that the way the company's structured, with a charity as well, that the, they will be encouraged and the company will be encouraged to take a wider responsibility to the community. Although I have to say that the company already does consider its community responsibilities um, and take them very seriously. So, you know, I don't think that wealth, I don't think employee ownership personally is about spreading wealth. I think it's about spreading engagement and purpose, first and foremost. We've got, okay, here's Steve. Alistair, Parfait. Steve Parfett. Um, you were a pioneer and um, very much ahead of the rest of us in identifying the challenges um, to the environment and, and the attraction of green politics. I believe, and Martin, you might not thank me for bringing politics into it, that the, sing the only single sane politician in Parliament at the moment is Caroline Lucas. Uh, and I wonder if, given your background in the Greens, um, whether you see a pathway that would get us to the point where the Germans are in terms of green politics being a credible alternative to the mainstream? Probably. Yeah, but interestingly, Caroline Lucas, you may not know this, was voted twice by her fellow MPs as being the most popular parliamentarian. She's a remarkable woman. I'd like to see her as Prime Minister. But we'll never get there while we have our current political system, I think. Unless there's some sort of, you know, with. Um, our first past the post system, which the Germans don't have. But you never know, there might be some sort of earthquake. There are a lot of earthquakes around at the moment, aren't there? And who knows what will happen. Maybe, um, maybe something's gonna happen to frighten us all into adopting a new political system, which gives a concern for the environment first place. At the moment, for us not to put it first place is kind of strange and, and tragic. But in a quick word, it's not going to happen while we have our current system. Yeah. Alistair, I'm interested in your personality, maverick sort of style. And I just wondered what would be the difference in Saw Days in five, ten years' time if you weren't on the board now? In other words, what do you bring to the board that makes it different? Well, I think I suppose I bring myself to it and my, my particular style. Maybe, maybe. The Mavericks 
in the company working there now will, will, will rise up to the surface. Um, that's probably the most sensible answer. Um, by standing back, um, other people will have space to express themselves and to be their own maverick personalities. And I hope that as time goes by, yeah, I really hope that happens, that the engagement and a sense of purpose will bring that out. I don't know, it all depends, doesn't it, on who's there, what, we're recruiting a new chair for the company, what sort of chair we have, you know, how Mike develops in, in his, in his uh, relationship with the company and the values and how the board develops and how the employees develop. It's fingers crossed, but there are always mavericks out there, you just need to bring them on. Up so we can get the microphone to you. Thank you. I can see a couple of mavericks sitting in the front row right now next to Mike. <laughs> Thank you. We've gone through an enormous number of plastic cups since we've been here the last couple of days. What would the members of Extinction Rebellion uh, do about that? We've gone through a large number of plastic cups which we're drinking water from the last couple of days. What do you think the Extinction Rebellion would do about that? We wouldn't do it. It wouldn't happen. Um, a lot of things we wouldn't do. Um, I mean, we all know what to do, don't we? We really do know what to do, but can, will we do it? So why does it need a bunch of rebellious... Actually, they're not all anarchists. I mean, the person who's had most influence on me in the Extinction Rebellion is, a, is a, um, an academic, um, a university academic. So we all know what to do. Um, what, why aren't we doing it? I mean, think for example, I would say to all of you, if you want to make a difference, one of the simplest things you do, the two things, one is to make sure you eat organic food in your companies. Never have a bite that's not organic or from a, com or from a source you understand. And secondly, to make sure you know where your money is. You can be the nicest people in the world. You, you're employee owned, you're coming to these conferences, you know that you're lovely people. With, the, with your fellow human beings at heart. But um, if your money is doing exactly the opposite that you're doing, quietly behind the scenes, then you're missing a trick. So those are the two things I think are most important. Have we got any more questions? I would like to put Mike on the spot, if that's all right, and ask Mike, who's at the front here, why did you take the job with Saw Days? Having walked in, you'd met Alistair, you'd seen the grand piano, I imagine. Yeah, it was the uh, piano that sold it to me. Um, <laughs> no, I, I've worked for lots of companies, and I've I worked for Britney Ferries, and uh, it was a real sense of purpose at that company, but I felt that I achieved everything I could. Um, and I wanted to move on to a company where I could make a difference as well, and that had real purpose and soul behind it. And um, having met Alistair, um, met Alistair in the bookstore, funny enough, um, I don't know if you remember Alistair, but uh, uh, as prior to our um, interview, uh, I was launching my memoirs, available in all good bookshops. <laughs> Independent bookshops. And I wanted, to see, I wanted to see the whites of his eyes and um, get a real sense of who he was. So at the end of it, I said, can you sign my book and say, good luck on Monday, because you interviewed me. <laughs> Um, and it was him talking to people and engaging with people that made me think, yes, actually this feels right. So, yeah, that was my journey, I suppose. What difference do you think you will make? You say you want to make a difference. What is that difference? I think it's about carrying on the legacy. Um, we've got a very special company with a great sort of ethos. Um, we're doing great work. Um, the team is lovely. So I've been fortunate to be given something that is... Um, feels very valuable, um, very lovely. So my job is to make sure I don't screw it up, as somebody said earlier. Um, but also to take it forward and do good things for the company um, and be a force for good, a force for change as well. Thank you for not minding me putting you on the spot. Thank you for all of your questions. Thank you for, for answering so humorously. Thank you for your jacket. Thank you for the paracetamol and good luck with your Extinction Rebellion. Alistair Sorday, thank you very much. Thank you.